Father, this morning we, we praise you because you have loved us. You've given us life in your Son. You have drawn us to yourself. And, and Lord, we're here to praise you. We're here to tell you that we love you and, and we appreciate how you've worked in our lives. And as we've gathered here to worship you this morning, Lord, we, we acknowledge that there are many distractions that, that block us from hearing you. So today we pray that we would hear your voice. God, that you would take the, the stress, the anxieties, the worries, the fears, the concerns, the conflicts that are crowding our minds, and you just give us peace and clarity so that we can tune into your spirit and we can really hear your voice today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, I'm Adela, and this is my journey to freedom. I'm a grateful follower of Jesus Christ, and I've been held captive by food addiction for a good portion of my life. I've always been overweight, was never picked for sports teams, never picked as a friend because of being overweight. I was never popular. So I chose food as my best friend, my comforter. Everywhere I went, food was always there. Every year I gained weight, um, faithfully 10 to 15 pounds a year. I ended up, my maximum weight was between 450 and 475. I had more faith in food than I did in God. When I found out I wasn't going to be the adoptive parent of the little girl that I had for nine months, I sat home, cried the whole day, and then I decided that um, I was going to go uh, do something for myself for a change, not go into depression. So I decided to go to the gym. And I went to the gym and I saw all the cars there. Um, fear came up with inside me and I didn't even go inside. Then a friend called me up and asked me how it would go at the gym. And um, I told her it didn't. And uh, she said, I know some friends there, I'll, let's, go to the gym, I'll introduce you. We went to the gym, she introduced me, and somebody had told me about a class at Calvary Baptist Church called PRISM. I went to the PRISM class, faithfully decided that um, eating healthy uh, would be great for um, going to the gym. And um, the leader of the class, Christy Donaldson, was a great accountability partner. She always led me to Jesus, pointed to the cross. At the end of the class, she invited me to go to celebrate recovery, to help me deal with the things that led me to overeat. For the past two years, I've been um, learning more about God's love, grace, and mercy. Um, I've learned God's freedom. Um, I know that where the Spirit, the Bible says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I feel freedom in Jesus now. I depended more on food than I did on Christ. And I've been on this journey to freedom for two years now. And um, I'm learning slowly to depend more upon Christ than food. Isn't that an awesome story? Uh, you know, uh, and I appreciate Adela and being willing to share that story. And she has been uh, available. If you if you are someone who is uh, struggling with a food addiction or a body image issue, or you're just stuck and you want to know how uh, how she made it, uh, she's going to be available after the service uh, with the prayer ministry team right up here in the front. This is Adela sitting right up here in the front row. Uh, and by the way, yeah. I ah, love her story. By the way, her, uh, she, God has given her victory so, to this point, freedom to this point, over 165 pounds. Isn't that cool? And I love the fact that it's been a process, a journey that she's still on. Uh, we are continuing our study in, uh, called Journey to Freedom. I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible app and 
and turn to Exodus chapter 5. We're going to be uh, looking at uh, the end of chapter 4, the beginning of chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible with you, grab one of the ones in the pews around you. They look like this. And uh, turn to page 61, because that's where we're going to be. You know, it's not as much how the journey begins as where the journey leads you. Um, I was 14 years old when I first met my wife. Saw her walking across the church courtyard uh, at our church in Tempe, Arizona. She was 13 years old. And I thought, wow, she's cute. <laughs> I'm confessing, they weren't really godly thoughts, but uh, I was 14. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, who's that new girl? I got to meet her before she learns out, you know, finds out what kind of a nerd I am. So... Uh, you know, that summer we went to youth camp together, and while we were at youth camp, I, you know, hit on her. I asked her if she wanted to go for a walk in the prayer gardens. Uh, she said no, <laughs> which, you know, was kind of a pattern of our relationship early on. Uh, in fact, her, uh, her freshman year, her sophomore year, her junior year of high school, she turned me down for the homecoming dance every year. Uh, don't worry, she wasn't the only girl that turned me down. Uh, so, uh, you know, as we grew up, as I outgrew some of my nerdiness, and as she got a lot wiser, uh, eventually she said yes, and we started dating, and I'm proud to say that her senior homecoming dance, she took me. Uh, and uh, she made her ask me and everything. Uh, but uh, now we've been married over 30 years. And, uh, and it's not how the journey begins. It's where the journey leads you. Uh, in 1988, I graduated from uh, Southern Seminary with my master's degree. Took my first full-time church in this crazy place called Albany, Georgia. Bind Memorial Baptist Church. And I uh, went there to be the youth pastor, uh, on fire, ready to serve God. And the first six months I was there, everything went wrong. Everything. I had youth that were mad at me. I had parents who were mad at me. I had youth workers who were angry at me. We had this, like, sex scandal and part of the youth group. Had to kick this kid out of the youth group. And at the six-month mark uh, of my time there, the chairman of the search team that had hired me came into my office and he said, you know, for all intents and purposes, your ministry here is over. You've failed. You got, you got nothing. And four years later, when I left there to come here, that same man had stood in my office and said, I was wrong and I'm grieving the fact that my kids aren't going to grow up in your ministry. It's not how the journey begins as much as where the journey takes you. Um, Today we're continuing our journey to freedom. We're looking at Exodus 4 through 6 with this question, what if your journey to freedom has a rocky start? What if your journey to freedom gets off on the wrong foot? What if you stumble right out of the gate? Because, uh, uh, you know, some of you came last week and, and you got excited. Hey, journey to freedom, I, I need that. I'm going to take that. I'm going to take God up on his offer as he calls us out of captivity. In the same way that he called Moses to lead the children of Israel out of uh, captivity, he's calling us, calling us out of captivity. He said, I'm going to do this. I'm going I'm to change my life. I'm going to let God work in me. You know, I'm, I'm going I'm to go to church. I'm going to fix my marriage. I'm going to break this addiction. I'm going to change these habits. Uh, I'm going to get out of debt. I'm going to do all these things I need to do. And, and, and you were enthusiastic. You were excited. You shared this with family, with friends, with people. And then everything fell apart. You've had the worst week of your life. Uh, and what do you do then when everything doesn't turn out the way that you were praying it would turn out? So what do we do at that point? Well, I hope that you will learn from our hero, Moses. Um, let's pick up the story in chapter 4, verse 29. Remember, Moses uh, argued with God about being his servant and finally gave in, said, okay, I'll do this. If you're calling me to, to do this, I'll, I'll take on this task. Yeah, he teamed up with his brother Aaron, and, and they came to Egypt to the leaders of the Israelites. And, and that's where the story continues. Verse 29 says, Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. 
and the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel, that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. Wow. That's so cool. I mean, you know, they've been crying out to God to set them free. They've been, you know, waiting for God to do something. God calls Moses. Moses shows up and he says, look, God has heard your prayers. And God has enlisted me to come and set you free. Literally, Moses is like, here I am to set you free. Hey, everybody get the Mighty Mouse reference there? Yeah, well, if you don't know Mighty Mouse, go home and YouTube him, okay? And, and then you'll get it. It's kind of a generational thing. Some of you younger ones are like, What's that from? Uh, it's okay. Uh, it's on there because I checked. And, and so uh, he is like the hero of the moment. He's like, it's okay, guys. Step back. I've got this handled. And so Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh. And they say, let our people go out into the desert to worship our God. And Pharaoh says, no. Who is your God? I don't know anything about your God, this God of the Hebrews. And in fact, I think the people are lazy. They want to go out and you worship God. That means they got time on their hands. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep their workload the same, but I'm not going to give them as many resources. They have to go out and collect their own resources, their straw for this, the bricks, uh, and yet they got to do just as many bricks. Not exactly what Moses thought was going to happen. That is not a good start. And it gets worse because uh, if you look at chapter 5, verse 20, uh, it tells you how the leaders of Israel reacted. It said, They met Moses and Aaron, who were waiting for them, as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, The Lord look on you and judge, because you have made a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Thanks a lot, Mr. Hero. You're some kind of you know, deliverer you are. You're going to set us free. And, and, and what happens instead is that now Pharaoh's angry with us and he's given us more work to do. And, and they're oppressing us even worse than it was before. Good job. Yeah, if heroes like you, we don't really need to be oppressed. And so Moses then, uh, well, let's look at his accusation because he's pretty angry at God. Uh, Continuing in verse 22, it says, Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why, why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Do you hear what Moses is saying to God? God... I'm calling you out. You said you were going to use me to set these people free, and, and you're letting me down, and you're deceiving the people, and you haven't done anything yet. You even made evil happen to them, and, and you haven't done what you said you'd do. That's pretty bold stuff for Moses. I mean, you guys would never get mad at God, would you? I mean, you've never said to God anything like, God, why me? Why is this happening to me? You said you love me. Why is this going on? Why is it working out this way? It's supposed to be better than this. I'm trying to follow you. Why is it all going wrong? So Moses accuses God. And then it tells us God's response. Chapter 6, verse 1. Actually, there's a long response from God, but I'm just going to read this first verse. You get the point. But the Lord said to Moses... Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out. With a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God says, hey, Moses, just watch and see because I'm not finished yet. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet, Moses. I'm just getting started. And, and if you watch, you will see what I can do with my power. Now let's pause the story right there because... We know how the story ends, right? We've seen the movie. So I'm talking about the good one with Charlton Heston. And, uh, and so we know how it ends. We've read the story. We, we get the point that, you know, what's going to happen next is God's going to drop these ten plagues on Egypt. And, and uh, Pharaoh's going to finally say, you get out of here. And they're going to leave. And he's going to chase them. And they have that whole thing at the Red Sea, you know, that you got to drive through at Universal Studios. And, and uh and all that stuff, all the miracles happen, you know that. You know that, I know that. And so it's really easy for us to pause there at the end of chapter 5 and go, you faithless Israelites. 
I mean, God's going to show you some really cool stuff. And you guys are accusing God and you're angry at God and you're blaming God and you're mad and all this kind of stuff. You don't know what's coming. Exactly. They don't know what's coming. So let's talk about our difficult journey. Our difficult journey. Because if we follow Jesus, if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and we believe that he died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead, and we've made a commitment to follow Christ, then understand you are on a journey to freedom. You're on that journey. And, and there's a myth out there that is propagated by some Christians that, that kind of goes like this. If you follow Jesus and, and you obey Jesus and you have enough faith, then everything's going to work out just fine. You're gonna, you're gonna, everything's going to go your way and you're going to have favor with everybody and you're going to be healthy all the time and you're going to have success in business and have plenty of money and all this kind of stuff. It's just going to happen if you believe enough. And, and I'm telling you, that's not what you find when you read the Bible. Because Moses was doing exactly what God told him to do. And did things get better right away? No. No, they didn't. Things got worse. The people got treated worse. They got more oppressed. They, they, and, and they weren't really happy about that. And, and so it, when we ask God to change our lives, when we ask God to set us free, it means that we're living in captivity. And usually we're in that captivity by our own choosing. We've decided to be there, and now we're asking God to help us get out of there. And, and we need a miracle. We need God's power to set us free. But what we really want is the magic pill, right? We want God to say the word, and everything is perfect. No problems, no stress. It's, it's just smooth sailing. That's not usually how it works. Uh, I talk to addicts, and they tell me that the first 30 days of sobriety is the hardest. They're going to stumble and fall. That's when they're going to do it. Uh, anybody here think breaking a bad habit is easy? Yeah, it stinks, doesn't it? Because you're like, ah, oh, I like this, but I got to quit it. I got to give it up. And, and you try, and you, and you, you always are like, oh, I'm going to start tomorrow. Because <laughs> tomorrow never comes. And, and, you know, it's just the way it is. Or how about this? You ever, you ever recognize that uh, you and your spouse have the same argument just different days? You ever notice that? It's called a pattern of, of you know, uh, that we get into. It's, a, it's like a script that we've written. And, and you know what they're going to say before they say it. They know what you're going to say. And it doesn't matter what trips the argument. You guys always end up back in the same place. You go, this is stupid. And yet to change that is one of the hardest things. Yet every one of us can change those because we can rewrite the script. We just don't do it. It's not easy to do. So what do we do when our journey to freedom has a rocky start? Um, I'm going to share with you two ideas, two words, literally, that um, I'm pretty sure you're not going to be really excited to hear. I was writing this, and I was going, this is not going to be one of those sexy sermons, you know? Not sure that there are sexy sermons, but in my world, maybe there are. And, and, uh, and so it's not going to be a lot of fun to hear these two words, these two ideas, but they are absolutely essential for our journey to freedom to happen. If you want God to lead you on a journey to freedom, these are parts of it that, that we're going to have to grab hold of and embrace if we're going to get there. I say this because the Israelites had to, Moses had to, and it's true for us as well. The first word I want to share with you is the word endure. If you're going to make it on your journey to freedom, you got to endure. You got to persevere. You got to tough it out. You got to suck it up. You got to keep going. Why? Because it's part of the process that God has told us about and it's part of the process that he uses to get us to freedom. The Apostle Paul wrote about it, kind of told us about this process in Romans chapter 5. And it's way back in the New Testament. And, and I'm just going to tell you, if you struggle with enduring, then you got to mark this passage. you got to get familiar with it. you got to meditate on it because this is not going to change. This is how God does it in our lives. So Paul says, not only that, this is Romans 5, verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. 
And endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. See, the moment that you confess Christ, God put his Holy Spirit in you, and and he wants to grow you up and lead you to freedom. And here's the process by which he's going to do that. He's going to have you endure because suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces, did you guys read the same script I did? (laughs) Character. And character produces hope. And hope is what leads us to victory. It's what leads us to freedom because we believe God and we know that his promises are going to come true. So, but we, we're, we're in this process because of these two realities. First one is that suffering and pain is part of life. Amen? I mean, are you guys hurting? Because last time I checked, every person I've ever talked to has pain. They have heartache, they have loss, they have struggles, they, they have things that, that are going on in their relationships, they might have things going on in their health, and, and, and things with their job. We, we all have struggles, and, and sometimes we forget that. It's really healthy to remember that everybody's hurting, not just you. Because when you think that your pain is worse than everybody else's, you diminish theirs and you become really difficult to be around. Can I just be honest with you about that? So, so recognize, we all recognize that you're hurting, you're struggling, but look around you. So are the people sitting next to you. We're all struggling because we live in this world that has been broken by sin and tainted by sin and it hurts us. So the second reality that kind of fits with that is that most of us in this room want to follow Jesus. We want to be like Christ. Do you guys want to be like Jesus? Okay, you want to be like Christ. And the only way to really make sense out of these two realities is to connect them with endurance. Endurance. When we endure, God teaches us the character of Jesus. Did you catch that? Suffering, the pain in our life, produces endurance. And endurance, when we endure, produces character. So we want to live in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And the way that we get there is by enduring. It's endurance. And and, and that's why endurance is so important and there's no shortcut for it because if we want the character of Christ, we can't get there unless we endure. Um, And endurance is the foundation for godly character. Do you guys see that they're doing work on the property? Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah, I, I don't know about you, but it's not progressing fast enough for me. You know, I, want, I like seeing stuff happen, but I want to see stuff happen. You know, but they, they, you know, so every week I come in and go, so what's happening this week? What's going on this week, you know? And, and, uh, and I was told that this week or next, uh, they're planning on starting the footings, <laughs> which means they're getting ready to pour the foundation for the building. And, and just for the record, I want them to do an excellent job at the foundation. Because if the foundation's not good, what happens? Yeah, the building will fall down at some point. Put enough stress on it, and it's going to collapse. In our lives, if we don't have the foundation of godly character, then when tough times come, what's going to happen to our lives? We're going to fall. We're going to collapse. God doesn't want you to collapse. He doesn't want you to go back into captivity. And so he's going to do what it takes to build godly character in your life, which means that you're going to have to learn how to endure. And how are you going to learn how to endure unless you go through suffering? Which is why Paul says we rejoice in our sufferings because that's going to produce endurance. And endurance is going to produce character. And character is going to lead you to that place where you live in hope. In hope. Now understand, you will be tempted to quit. You'll be tempted to throw in the towel, to give up, and go back to captivity because it's easier. But God is calling us to endure. 
not the whiny, complaining, I just got, you know, enduring, but with an expectant attitude of hope that God will deliver us, that God will show up and work in my life. Endure. That's the first idea. Second one probably isn't as much fun as that, and that word is wait. Wait, because we all like to wait, don't we? Anyone like to wait at all? No. No. See, you thought endurance was hard. Now we got to wait. We don't want to wait. You know, by the way, if somebody tells you to be patient, it's too late, right? (laughs) Because you already aren't being patient. Because we want it and we want it now. now. That's right. That's why we have fast food. Because we can't wait for it. Fast food. And in fact, I don't even want to take the time to get out of my car. I'm going to go through the drive-up lane in fast food. And then I'm going to get irritated because you're in front of me. Because you want the same thing. Right? You guys that way? That's why there's a fast lane in the, on the highway. Because we want to drive faster. We want to get there. You know? It's all about fast. We don't want to wait. I don't want to wait. You don't want to wait. And yet, God <laughs> wants us to wait. He wants us to wait. He tells us that. In fact, he tells us over and over and over again in Scripture. My favorite time that he tells us that is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isn't that cool? But we have to wait upon the Lord. And then he makes us strong and and we're able to fly. That's kind of cool. We're able to finish the race. That's kind of cool. Why? Because we, we wait on God to show up and to deliver us. To reveal his power in our midst. And by the way, waiting on God means that we expect God to work while we continue in obedience. Doesn't mean that we just like, all right, I guess God's not going to show up. I'm going to go back to how it was before. No, We believe God and we believe he's going to show up and we believe he's going to work in our life. And so we continue obeying him as best we can. It's not giving up on God. It's waiting for him to work. Um, In 2002, I had just finished 10 years as pastor here at Calvary. And, and the church was growing, and we'd built a couple of buildings, and, and, and we were uh, pretty excited. I was pretty tired. And the church, in their wisdom, said, hey, you need a sabbatical. Take a month off to refresh, renew, spend some family time. And, and I was excited about that. I was like, okay, this is going to be great. We had a lot of fun as a family plan. But the, the, kind of the highlight of that month off was my sabbatical, uh, where I just took a week and spent it with God. I went up to my brother's cabin. Nobody was there. I was going to read. I was going to pray. I wanted to see God face to face. I wanted to hear from God to know what he wanted me to do with my life and, and what he wanted me to lead Calvary to. And, uh, and so I was with anticipation. I went for that week away. And, and can I just tell you that it was a great week and God spoke to me, but uh, I didn't like what he said. I didn't like what he said. It was kind of annoying because God does, it could be that way. Um. Uh, because here was the message that God gave me. It was clear. I mean, it was as clear as just about any other time in my life that I've heard God really communicate something to me. And, and you guys can probably guess what he told me because he told me to, to wait. He told me to wait. Like, God, no, I want to know what's next. I want to know what, how to go forward. I want to know who, and he's like, wait. No, God, I'm, I'm really, come on, reveals it. Wait. Okay, I knew that was from God. I came back from my sabbatical, and people were like, so, did you meet with God? What did God tell you? And I said, um, you know, God told me to wait. <laughs> you know, and the people who loved me, they were like, oh, that's interesting, disappointing, but interesting. And the people who weren't really in my corner actually ridiculed me. Wait, we don't have time for that, wait. You know, we need somebody with vision. I mean, wait. And then God changed everything. In the, in the next 60 to 90 days from the time that I set foot back on this property, uh, God revealed and removed the embezzler on our staff, who was a cancer in our midst and, and was divisive in the church. And God just removed him. Uh, God saved Calvary Christian Academy, the ministry that has blessed so many. God unified Calvary like never before. And here's the fun part. God started the house cleaning when I was out of the country on a mission trip to Africa. 
because God wanted to clean house while I was gone so that we could become the church that you're a part of today. And God knew that I would get in the way and I would be impatient and I would try to fix stuff and God was telling me, wait. You know, as much as I don't like to wait nowadays, I'm a whole lot better at it because I've seen God's power revealed in those moments when I let him do the work. So God is saying to us today, endure, wait, because it's not how the journey begins, but where the journey takes you. And and, and some of you are are here today and and you're on the verge of giving up. You're on the verge of quitting. You're on the verge of throwing in the towel. Maybe it's your walk with God. Maybe it's your relationship with your family. Maybe it's life itself. And God is saying to you today, endure. Endure. I'm building something in you that, that is worth the pain. And some of you are just tired of waiting. You're impatient. You're saying, I want to see results now. I, I want to do it now. I want it to happen right now. And, and, and God is saying, wait. Wait. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something that surprises you. I'm going to do something way beyond your imagination. I've got plans for you. But you got to wait for me to do it. You can't make it happen yourself. The Apostle Paul put it this way, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Here, here, this is a verse you can live by. He says, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Isn't that cool? Let us not grow weary of doing the things that God has called us to do, for in due season we'll reap a harvest beyond anything you've ever imagined. You will see the results. If we don't quit. So God is calling us to endure. Are you willing to wait and see the power of God in your life? Because we're the ones who decide if we're going to endure and if we're going to wait. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are patient with us. You wait so long for us to finally open our eyes and see your goodness, to to follow your voice, to let you change our lives. Father, you know how much we complain about the pain, the struggle, the sufferings that we have to face. Help us to see that you're with us, that you never leave us or forsake us. Help us to see what you're building in our lives. Help us to just to understand how you're moving. And fill us today with that hope. Give us the strength to endure. Give us the the ability to wait on you because you are good and you are leading us to freedom. Father, I pray that we would hear your voice and we would follow you to life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.